Hi, good morning. It's it's almost afternoon, huh? Yeah. It's a pretty day outside, that's for sure.
green light? No. There we go. Perfect. Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Efren Manjarez. I'm coming from the University of Miami. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's my first time in Alabama, and so it's really nice to be here. Uh, just briefly, a little bit about myself. Before we get started on our topic, I was born in Mexico. I grew up in Los Angeles. I did all my schooling at the University of California, and then I went to Miami for internal medicine and pediatrics residency. And then about a year after that, I started hospital medicine uh, exactly 19 years ago this week at the University of Miami. I'm the past division chief, and, and my professional interests are patient safety, quality improvement, transitions of care, and perioperative medicine. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get going. I know you guys are getting your food, uh, which is, looks great. During uh, this talk, what I'd like to do is hopefully teach you a few new things, but also show you some data that may validate some of the things that you're already doing. And along the way, I'll, I'll chime in some uh, personal anecdotes on some of these papers and what I've done before. So we ready to go? Or are you guys already get lulling with that lunch that's putting you to sleep? All right, terrific, let's get going. So I don't have any disclosures. What we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna identify readmissions as a problem. We're going to identify patient populations that are at risk for readmission. And then we're gonna talk about evidence-based strategies to reduce readmissions and, and tracking your data through multiple sources. Here's our agenda, lots of stuff. Okay, so let's get going. So the background to this, I think I'm gonna put on my glasses since the type here is very small. The background to this is that readmissions are frequently due to deficiencies in discharge planning. And 30-day readmissions are the result of care that's provided at the time of discharge. And interestingly, since 2012, CMS doesn't forgive this anymore with financial penalties. Now, I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna say, but Dr. Manjares, you know, we did everything right, and the patient still came back, right? It's almost like a never event, right? You gave them DVT prophylaxis, and they still got a DVT, right? So you can't do everything perfect, but there are ways that we can get the readmissions down. So this is really interesting from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. If you look, the higher graph on the left, it's on day of discharge. And you can see at the very beginning, the first few days, the first week after discharge, you've already got 40% of your readmissions. And then at about 14 days, you've got two thirds of your readmissions. And the rising graph going from left to right, it's showing you cumulatively what percentage of your readmissions. So at 14 days, two thirds of your readmissions have already happened. Keep that in mind as we go through and we talk about what strategies are in place and what can you do to prevent those readmissions from happening. As you can see, they happen very early on. This is a slide put together from my friends at Boston University, Jeff Greenwald and colleagues. And if you look at this, you say, wow, any one of these risk factors, a deficiency can cause a readmission. So for example, at the very bottom in the center, it says, does not keep a follow-up appointment. Well, maybe they weren't made a follow-up appointment. Um, also, there's issues related to tests. Maybe there was a blood culture that came back positive after the patient was discharged. So any one of these, whether they're hospital healthcare system related issues, whether they're patient related issues, or whether they're clinician-related issues, any of those can cause a readmission. 
So changing topics, let's talk about who's at risk for readmissions. So there was this paper that was published 10 years ago, and the God honest truth is the data doesn't look any different. I searched the literature. The top five medical readmissions, you guys all know this, right? How many of my hospitalists are here? Any hospitalists here? They're all doing discharges before noon, that's why. So, are you guys surgeons? Any surgeons? Cardiologists? Other medical specialists? I see a bunch of residents here. Okay, so the top five diagnoses for readmissions at 30 days are heart failure, pneumonia, and COPD. And then, of course, you've got psychoses and GI disorders. But the big three are heart failure, COPD, and pneumonia. So what they did in this particular study is they looked at the CMS data and they said, over the course of one calendar year, what were the most frequent medical diagnoses and what were the most frequent surgical diagnoses? And if you look, some of the surgical diagnoses are actually medical diagnoses, like cardiac stent placement, right? That's really coming in for an acute coronary syndrome. Then you've got major arthroplasties, vascular surgeries, gut surgeries. I mean, what are they missing from here? I mean, they've got pretty much everything except for urology and neurosurgery here, right? So as you look at this, overall 30-day readmissions was more than 20% for medical conditions. And for surgical conditions, it was 15%. And frankly, the needle hasn't moved fast enough over the last 10 years since this data has been published, in all sincerity. The cost to Medicare for those readmissions was $17 billion. And you know, back when this was published, our friend Mr. Obama says, God, we've got to cut health care costs, right? And he targeted readmissions. And that's where those penalties started to come from. But interestingly, 30-day post-discharge mortality was 3%. Right? But again, looking back at these medical patients, if you discharge five people today from your service, ask yourself, which one of those five is coming back within 30 days? I tell that to my residents. Okay, we've got five discharges. Which one of these is coming back in the next 30 days? And that's the one you have to work on to make sure that that discharge is nice and tidy. Interestingly, the authors also found that of the medical patients that were discharged, 50% of them that were readmitted within 30 days, they didn't have a bill for outpatient follow-up. They didn't have a bill, so nobody saw them. So, how does this data compare with your own institution here? Does this surprise you, this data? Anybody? Raise your hand. Does that data look like what you're thinking? Does it validate what happens around here as well? Who keeps these data for you? Is your quality director here? Is your CFO here? So they're the ones that are probably keeping this data for you. Hospital medicine medical director would probably keep this. Um, are there report cards provided for the physicians and the provider groups to let them know what their data looks like and, and for opportunities to uh, improve? Um, and how do you communicate this data to uh, your colleagues? So some things that we're gonna think about as we move forward the rest of this time. Okay, so switching topics. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this happens anywhere else besides the Manjares household. Does this happen here in Alabama? All right, so. <laughs> so what about, well, the physicians, they must know who's gonna get readmitted, right? They've gotta know who's gonna get readmitted. So they looked at almost a thousand physicians. They looked at primary care physicians the admitting doctor, as you guys know, hospitalists aren't always on, on board for the whole hospitalization. The discharging doctor. And they asked them, they asked them, you know, why do you think these patients were readmitted? And the cohort of patients wasn't very sick. Um, they weren't very old. Mean age was 55. A small fraction had cancer. A smaller fraction had COPD and dialysis. Only 3% had CHF. Um, and the number one reason that was cited by these physicians at these 12 academic medical centers was self-management plan at discharge. In other words, they said, it wasn't me, right? I discharged them, they were ready to go. So what their feeling was is that patients needed to have a good self-management plan, getting them home, making sure they're plugged into community resources, 
and making sure that they've got the support at home when they go home. Um, so again, the physician said, it's not me, it's after me. So how do you identify patients who are at risk? Well, we first talked about medical diagnoses. We talked about surgical diagnoses. Some friends of mine at UCSF, they did a study on their own, looking at their own single center place, and they found things like Medicaid, and they found things like, believe it or not, um, depression, and some of those things. So they actually found other diagnoses, believe it or not. There was an Australian paper published at the same time that said that psychiatric disorders, like depression and so forth, were also associated with readmissions. So my take on that was, Everybody who looks at their own data when they do single center studies, they're going to identify their own risk factors. But this was an interesting paper looking to sort out which patients were at risk if you were to create a tool. And this is called the hospital score. And in this particular study, what they looked at was the most common causes for readmission on the medical side, which was, again, we know it, CHF. COPD, acute MI, and pneumonia. And they said, okay, how does this score work in predicting readmission at 30 days in these 10,000 patients? And so they looked at this at six academic medical centers in calendar year of 2011 with the major outcome of just being 30-day readmissions for those four particular diagnoses. So the hospital score, it's low hemoglobin, which is the H, Discharge from the oncology service, which has more points. Hyponatremia. Did they get a procedure during their hospital stay? Um, was this an emergency admission versus an elective admission? And then the number of hospital admissions in the last year. And then was the length of stay more than five days? And so as you look at this, they wanted to validate all these particular points. So here's what they did. They looked at almost 80,000 admissions. Of those 80,000 admissions, about 11% of them were from those four index conditions. And they looked at the very bottom where it says PAR, what were the preventable readmissions? And you can see that for pneumonia, about 11% were preventable. For heart failure, 15% were preventable. For COPD, 15% were preventable. And for acute MI, almost 13% were preventable. If you look to see how the predictor works, if you look in the middle where you see the p-value less than 0.001, that's where all of those points from the hospital score, each one of those seven or eight factors, they were more associated with readmission versus not. And then at the bottom, the hospital score tells you whether they were low risk, low risk being um, less than a few points, uh, and high risk being more than seven points. And in a dose-response relationship, those patients were readmitted. Looking at those four diagnoses, I don't know if the font shows up very well, but the third, or the next to last column, the C statistic. When the C statistic is about 0 0.7, and in this case it was about 0 0.7, it means that the risk prediction rule is good at predicting your outcomes. And it was about 0 0.68, 0 0.69, 0 0.7 across the board for these conditions, for potentially preventable admissions for those four conditions. For patients over the age of 65, if they had those four conditions, the hospital score worked to predict readmissions. And all 30-day readmissions, it worked. So this tool worked. Um, you guys have Cerner here, as I understand. Um, we have uh, Epic. And so coming up in the next risk prediction rule, I'm going to show you what, what we do as well over there. So changing topics, uh, let's talk about another risk prediction rule called the LACE score. So the LACE score not only predicts 30-day readmissions and mortality. This is actually the one that we use at our facility. And it's only four factors, L, A, C, and E. And the idea was that this was actually derived in Canada uh, with about 5,000 patients, and then they validated it with a second validation cohort of a million patients. And this was both academic and community hospitals, which was a nice thing. And they were looking at death and hospital readmission at 30 days, not just, not just readmission.
So if you look at the risk factors for the four pieces, the L is for length of stay, the A is for acuity of admission, the C is for the Charleston comorbidity score, and the E is for emergency department visits. Four simple pieces. Now the Charleston comorbidity score, if, if you guys aren't familiar with it, is a risk prediction tool for illness severity. And it basically looks at the patient's age plus all the other medical diagnoses that you have, whether it's CHF, acute MI, kidney disease, cancer, et cetera, et cetera, and you get points for each one of them. And you can see that each one of those four pieces had an odds ratio that was statistically significant for predicting 30-day readmission and death. So let me go through it in a little bit more detail here. So the length of stay, when your length of stay starts going up over three days, it gets higher. Uh, your acuity for admission, if it was an, uh, an unplanned, non-elective admission, you get three points. The length of stay, you get up to seven points. The Charleston comorbidity score, you get up to five points. And then the number of visits to the ED in the last six months, you get up to four points. I think the total score is something like 19. And high risk is above 10. So this is looking at the readmissions um, from your LACE score. So the bars in blue are how many points up to 19 that you have. And then your light gray on the right is mortality. And the combination of both of those two is the curve. And it goes up in a dose-response relationship from 0 to 19. And so the higher your score, the higher your risk of readmission or death. Overall, 8% of the cohort were readmitted or passed away, which to me is a pretty low number. And as I mentioned, the, the high risk for LACE is a 12. So just as a quick little anecdote here, I was on service through the weekend, and the last case I saw on Sunday afternoon was a patient who was coming out of the ICU. He was a young 37-year-old guy who came in with uh, variceal bleeding, alcoholic. And as I logged into my screen, my home screen with all my pages, it actually had at the far right of the screen the LACE score. And all my other patients, it was fine, but this guy's popped up red. He was over 10 points. He had like 12 points. And so, you know, even before I went and looked at the guy, I said, okay, you know, what's going on with this guy? Why is he going to be readmitted? And sure enough, when I went to go see the guy, he wanted to leave against medical advice. Um, the, you know, the poor young man was alcoholic, and as I, I tallied up his score of all the things that were going on with him, I'm like, yep, this guy's had multiple readmissions for the same thing in the last six months. He's cirrhotic, although his age wasn't very high, it was an emergency admission. I'm like, yep, I can see this guy leaving AMA and then coming back when he's getting sick all over again. So this is the one that we use at our facility. Um, I don't know if you guys have something embedded into your EMR here, but um, on my screen, it's literally the last column on the right. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, as a hospitalist, if you want your hospitalist to, to focus on reducing 30-day readmissions, that should not be the last column on your screen. It should be much further into the middle where your hospitalist can see and understand what that data means, you know, to, to focus on that. Um, so how can you reduce readmissions? Well, we've talked about, first of all, we've identified the patient populations either by medical diagnosis or we've now talked about two risk prediction rules, the hospital score and the LACE score. Now what can you do about it? So this is sort of uh, a very, very interesting project that was published about 10 years ago. And it's called Project RED, Reengineering Discharge. And this was done at Boston Medical Center. They put in place 11 interventions, uh, about 750 patients. They ended up hiring a nurse discharge advocate and a clinical pharmacist to work with the medical team. <coughs> Excuse me. And their primary outcomes were 30-day readmission rate and ER visits. So what did this discharge advocate do for you? Well, they were responsible for medical education, I'm sorry, patient education, they were responsible for making sure the patient had their follow-up appointments and printing this out and giving it to the patient. They reviewed tests pending at discharge. They were responsible for ordering home health services and medication reconciliation, and then making sure the patient could actually teach back what was going on with them. They also reconciled the discharge plan to make sure that the patient was meeting core measures to make sure that they were hitting on all those anticipatory guidance, and then they gave this really, really nice printout of the discharge plan to the patient. 
I wish I, sh I should have printed it out for you. It had basically a list of the medicines, what does the pill look like, how many times a week they take it or how many times a day, and what's the indication for it, and what are some of the side effects. And at the very beginning, at, at the front page, it had a nice picture of the doctor and a nice picture of the, the, the discharge advocate with their contact information. It's actually very well done, very nicely done. And the results bore fruit. They found that the hospital utilization, which was a combination of, of the ER visits and the readmission rate, it improved. It improved. You can see on the right, there's sort of like a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the difference between those patients who were um, as part of the program versus the usual care. And there was a distinct separation in terms of the readmission rate reduction. A Little bit more detail. You can see that they reached statistical significance um, on these particular metrics. And then all these other sort of metrics that they looked at, like is the patient able to teach back? Can they identify their primary care physician? Were your questions answered? Sort of some patient satisfaction scores. Um, did you understand your problem? So all these things that, that they actually looked, that they looked pretty nice. So they saved $143,000 in readmission costs. Again, this was only a small pilot study of 750 patients. And they decreased utilization and they increased primary care physician follow-up and readiness for discharge. So, you know, at the end of this, you say, gosh, you know, that's a lot of stuff. You know, you've got to hire this discharge coordinator and, and then the, the, the hospital pharmacist also makes phone calls afterwards. Like, do you need all this stuff? Or can you look at each one of those interventions individually to see, you know, maybe, maybe you don't need the whole enchilada. Maybe you just need a couple of those interventions at your particular site. So next what I'd like to do with you is I want to go through with you some other interventions that, that looked at these in individually and in, uh, to see what the impact was. So this was a, a very nice study that was done by a, a friend and co-author of mine, Sunil Kripalani, who's now at Vanderbilt. Um, and he looked at the handoff communication at discharge between the discharging physician and the primary care physician. And you can see that there were deficits. There were deficits in the notification of discharge, in the notification of the discharge plan, and the lack of availability of a discharge summary at the first follow-up visit, and even at four weeks, where the patients were, did not have that information available when the primary care doctor saw the patient. So you can imagine the primary care doctor saying, God, you know, what was the med reconciliation? What was changed? Um, what was the patient's functional capacity when they left the hospital? Um, what do I need to follow up on as the primary care doctor? And again, all these other deficits that were missing and so forth. Again, primary care physicians, what they really want to know, and this is from other data that, that's been published, is they really want to know What's the medication reconciliation? How are the medicines different in case you don't have a uniform medical record? So again, all these deficits. So my take on this, you say, well, yeah, you know, but, but Dr. Manjares, you know, this was published over 10 years ago. Back then, maybe not everybody had a nice electronic medical record. Maybe you couldn't route the discharge summary to the primary care physician just by a click. So now that we've got that electronic medical record, sometimes you guys might have patients that the patient actually isn't a regular patient of your system. Maybe they just moved here to Birmingham area. Maybe they came from Nashville and all their care was done over there. Um, and so how does the patient take that information and get it to their next primary care physician? Well, believe it or not, um, my friends in South America, in Chile, what they do in that country is they hand the patient their discharge summary. They say, this is for you and it's your responsibility to take it to your primary care doctor. Uh, so, you know, if, if the primary care doctor can't get it in any other way, the patients are responsible for acting as their courier. In the first paper that I showed you, Project Red, everything was sort of done for the patients, right? Remember, it seems like everything is on the organization to make a, a difference, to do everything for patients, right? You remember when they had the Affordable Care Act, everything is like, this is what the healthcare system is going to do for you, but what is the patient responsible for? So how about having the patient be the courier for their own uh, discharge summary? The discharge summary needs to communicate to the primary care physician. Gosh, if they came in with a stroke, you know, what was their functional capacity beforehand? What's their new deficits? What's their new functional capacity so that when the patient arrives, they, they know how to receive that patient? Um, tell each 
provider who's going to see the patient as an outpatient, what they're responsible for. Okay, you know, the patient came in for atrial fibrillation and, and heart failure. Okay, so, you know, the, the cardiologist is going to follow up on the INR, and this is what the warfarin dose is, or if they're on a direct oral anticoagulant, it's easier. Uh, the primary care physician, please follow up the BMP because the furosemide and the lisinopril doses were increased during hospitalization, and this is what their, their values were at discharge. And then lastly, you know, the name and the cell phone number of the discharging provider, right? If, if you're not familiar with that doctor, how are you going to reach them in the office in real time if you've got a question? So the contact information should be there so that the, the receiving outpatient physician can call that doctor and say, oh, listen, you know, I have a question, and, and, and they can talk to them right away as opposed to having that, that loss of communication. What about patient education? We sort of mentioned that in, in the last paper. There is a very, very prolific investigator at the University of Colorado named Coleman. Um, I want to say Greg Coleman. And he did this patient education study with four pillars of patient education. How to manage your own medicines, a patient-centered health record that the patient's responsible for, timely follow-up with the primary care physician or the specialist, and then red flags and how to respond. So the way that they operationalized this was there was a transitions coach who did this. There were follow-up visits and phone calls, and they looked at 30-day readmission rate, 90-day, and 180-day readmission rate. And interestingly, the readmission rate dropped, but it didn't drop at 30 days, but it dropped at 90 days. This was a study of less than 800 patients, so it wasn't a large study. But the bottom line was is that it didn't work at 30 days, but it worked at 90 days. And certainly there were trends that showed an, a significant improvement. But the limitations were, you know, the patients had to be English speaking. Uh, so it doesn't really account for patients who have limited English proficiency doesn't account for healthcare illiterate patients, and it excluded patients with a diagnosis of dementia because they couldn't teach back. Um, do you guys have a very large Latino population around here, English limited? I'm just wondering, how do you handle people like that in terms of their patient education? Because I'm sure, you know, getting uh, patient education materials might be a little challenging in Spanish or other languages that you may be having here. So it's something to think about as well. Um, what about medication disparities, medication reconciliation? When medication reconciliation isn't 100%, that's also a risk factor for readmission. So this was another study by Dr. Coleman. It was looking at factors contributing to discrepancies in medication reconciliation at discharge. Small study, 375 patients. They had a nurse practitioner who made home visits relatively quickly, uh, one to three business days after the discharge. And what they found was that patients with zero medication discrepancies had a 30-day readmission rate of 6% versus more than double that for those who experienced even just one error. Even just one error. And it was interesting because the more patients that they were discharged on, the more likelihood for errors and the higher the readmission rate in this particular study. So let me show you right over here. Um, look at that. A significant number, at least a third of the patients, didn't take their medicines unintentionally. Oh, you know, I wanted to go talk to my primary care doctor to make sure that the medicines were okay with him. Oh, I thought that this was the, the same medicine or uh, similar to another medicine that I was taking. All these different reasons. But the bottom line is, is if medication reconciliation isn't done perfectly, even just one, it increases your risk for readmission. Um, so maybe sometimes that can be an issue. You know where I see this as, as an issue is that, do you guys have hospitalist services that work seven on, seven off here? Yeah, so we do. So sometimes one hospitalist admits the patient. Let's say you're on your electronic medical record Cerner and there's a therapeutic substitution. Maybe the patient came in on quietapine and your, your hospital formulary doesn't have that, so it switches you to another antipsychotic. And then at the very end, you're like, 
well, which one do I discharge the patient on? The one that they were taking at home or the one that we have in the hospital? Did the one in the hospital work? Should I switch them? And so you see those sorts of errors coming up. And then, of course, if you weren't the admitting physician, you might say, well, you know, I held this because of a, a medical reason. Maybe there was a concern for a side effect like hyponatremia. And so those sorts of issues related to med reconciliation happen when you have discontinuity of care between hospitalists that I'm seeing. Um, outpatient clinics, gap clinics, discharge clinics. This is actually a very, very nice intervention. So as, as we spoke of earlier, heart failure is the leading cause of rehospitalization, particularly obviously in elderly patients. And as we're getting older, as our population is getting older, we're expecting to see this, the incidence increase, correct? So the research question here was, what outpatient care processes may reduce 30-day readmission rate and mortality? So they did this in upstate New York. It was a community hospital. It wasn't an academic medical center. And they enrolled 415 patients in a heart failure clinic. And they looked at 30-day readmissions and mortality. So how do they operationalize this? Because this is really the devil in the details. So the admitting physician contacted what's called the clinical care coordinator at the heart failure clinic within 48 hours of hospital admission. And then that nurse coordinator, she was following the electronic me medical record to see when the patient was going to be discharged and so forth. And then when the patient was discharged, that care coordinator at outpatient clinic pulled the patient in. She called to make an appointment to make sure that the patient had an appointment and the patient typically had an appointment within 7 to 14 days. And then at the clinic, they gave the patients a prescription for blood pressure cuffs, for uh, scales to weigh themselves, and, and of course, more patient education about self-monitoring. And then they would call the patient every week for the first 60 days, the first two months. And if patients failed to respond to treatment, then they would start talking about palliative care and goals of care. So just briefly, the demographics here, it was even with respect to gender, the patients were over age 70. It was largely a Caucasian population with significant amount of smokers and significantly reduced ejection fraction on average in the 20s. Um, what happened there? 93% of the time, the two-day call was made. And then when patients came to clinic, you can see that a significant number of these patients had their diuretic dosing changed, and then they would all have medication changes, and they would make the calls to the patients to make sure that, uh, that, that they were followed up. And you can see that over uh, 60 days, the patients had five and a half calls made to them, and it worked. If you look at the bottom line, that's how the readmission rate dropped by half. Uh, it dropped from 16% to about 6% whereas the other service lines and the other hospitals that didn't participate in this discharge clinic, their readmission rate stayed in the 20s. Uh, so it was a very, very nice intervention. I can tell you that I, I was speaking on this topic and I was at a hospital in North Carolina and they did this beautifully. The way that they did this was, and it was in typical quality improvement fashion, PDSA fashion, and the way they did this was they started with a nurse practitioner on site who would see the patients within three business days of discharge. And because what happens is, is primary care physicians aren't always available. And maybe the cardiologist isn't always available. So they would see the patient at this nurse practitioner driven discharge clinic. It was actually a Duke Family Medicine Residency Hospital. And they dropped their readmission rate from the 20s to like 8%. And they sent me a brochure after I visited them showing that there was this one patient who'd been in the hospital like six times in the previous year. And then in the following year after this gap clinic was, was organized, he was only in the hospital once. How impressive is that? So they said, okay, we've got the CHF piece down pat. Now let's add pneumonia. And so when I had visited them, they were just getting ready to embark on adding pneumonia and then they were gonna go to COPD. So it illustrates quality improvement perspective, right? And techniques, right? You do a test of change, you make sure it works, and then you disseminate it. And you keep adding and adding to the process. And that's exactly what they did. And it's exactly what this particular hospital did as well, at the very least with CHF. So when the patients did not respond, those patients had goals of care discussion, and they were referred for palliative care.
And the patients who passed away, relatively speaking, they didn't die in the hospital, they died in palliative care, which also demonstrates um, cost cutting as well. This is a slide that I just added this morning because I saw this paper come up. Uh, as you talk about diseases, we talked about all this stuff about CHF. So there was this paper that was published in a, the COPD journal, some journal uh, by the COPD Foundation. And it was a small cohort of almost 300 COPD admissions in a community hospital in New Jersey. And of those 272, 20 were readmitted in 30 days. I forgot to put the reference there, I apologize. The patients who were readmitted were more likely to have pneumonia, issues with home safety, anxiety, and a lack of transportation. So when they put in this comprehensive plan, they reduced the readmissions by almost half, from 21% to 13%. So what did that plan have in place? Well, sort of similar to what we talked about before. They had a care navigator who reviewed the discharge medication reconciliation. They looked at financial difficulties with getting the medicines. They taught the correct and proper use of the inhaler and they made sure that the patient could teach it back before the patient was discharged. The discharge instructions and they made sure they, see the, they saw the pulmonologist within five days and they called back the patient at 48 hours and weekly for the first month. So with this, they reduced their readmissions by almost half, which is, which is pretty impressive. Um, hospital pharmacists, are you in the house? Yes. So um, is there a role just with hospital pharmacists? Uh, this paper was published about a year ago and it was a systematic review looking, I wanna say it was almost 30 studies. Um, about a little bit over half of them showed a reduction in readmissions, uh, depending on the study, between 3 and 30 percent. And the bottom line was that hospital pharmacists, if they did discharge and medication reconciliation before discharge, it worked. Um, and patient education. In my own hospital, the way that we use clinical pharmacists isn't for the med reconciliation at discharge, it's actually on admission in the emergency room. We actually have hospital. Uh, clinical pharmacists in the emergency room before I even get to see them. Once the ED doctor uh, says that the patient's coming in, the hospital pharmacist goes in, looks at all the meds, tells me if the patient's taking them, not taking them, and when was the last dose. And it makes it much easier. It makes it much easier to be able to do an admission because the hospital pharmacist can say, okay, you know, wh what were you taking for, you know, your water pill? And it's the same thing they tell me all the time. They probably tell you guys, it's a little white pill, <laughs> right? It's a little white pill. So the hospital pharmacist can pull up a picture and say, okay, was it this white pill? Was it this white pill? And then they can figure out the dose if they don't know, you know, what the dose is or what the agent was. Because it's always a little white pill. Even in Spanish, doctor es una pastilla blanca pequeñita. And I'm like, they're, they're all that way, right? I'm not a pharmacist, I'm a doctor. I don't know what all the pills look like. But at any rate, um, this highlights the fact that our hospital pharmacists have uh, a role to play, and there is data that, that supports their function as clinical pharmacists. Um, so switching topics, um, I want to talk to you about now, um, what does the Institute for Healthcare Improvement say uh, in terms of reduction of readmissions? Well, they say, first and foremost, you have to do a needs assessment. You have to look at your own data. We've sort of looked at now these national papers, some of them were single center interventions. Some of these were multi-center studies. And the bottom line is you have to look at your own data. Your own data might be different. So look at your own data to figure out what's going on. They said something called an expanded needs assessment, which I'm gonna describe in a, in a moment. Forming a cross continuum team. What does that mean? That means that this episode of healthcare does not end in the hospital. The continuum team is the primary care doctor and the outpatient specialist. And what about the nursing home? And of course, the home nursing agencies. What about pulling them in and being part of a cohesive team that starts in the hospital? Patient education and teach back. I'm gonna give you a, a few pointers of what they said there. Medication reconciliation, which we sort of already talked about and I won't get into more detail. Passing the baton, handing off to the next provider. Um, that's actually my area of expertise. I, I actually was one of the authors of the Society of Hospital Medicine's handoff recommendations that was published in the Journal of Hospital Medicine. So, and lastly, of course, two more things, arranging outpatient follow-up and engaging patients and their families. Um, so this is sort of a schematic of what all this looks like. 
you've got this decision to discharge the patient. And then you've got to hit all these different areas here to make sure that you don't miss anything. Now let's talk about the needs assessment. What did they say? Create a dashboard. The dashboard are which floors have the highest readmission rate? Which skilled nursing facilities that you partner with have the highest readmission rate? You got to have a brother brother talk with them, right? You got to pull them in and say, listen, you guys are having the highest readmission rate back to us. You're making us look bad. What's the percent average daily census due to readmitted patients, right? This is what your quality officers and your CFOs are looking at. How many days between hospital discharge and readmission? Because if you're thinking about putting in a, re uh, a discharge clinic, a gap clinic, you want to know that data, right? You want to know, you know, are they coming back right away? Are, are you getting, you know, 70% of your patients are readmitted within the first six days? Well, gosh, you got to get them, those patients seen in 48 hours, right? Um, the percent of patients that had follow-up scheduled. What about after discharge? Are these patients presenting back to the ED or urgent care centers and the number of days since discharge? What's the patient's functional status when they left the hospital? Was the discharge plan clear to the patients? Was there a teach back that was documented, right? So how, how can you drill down even more? Interview the patients and the family members. Oh, you know, so we, we, you know, our nurse managers back home, they call all the patients 24 hours later. Mrs. Martinez, we saw that you were discharged from the hospital by Dr. Manjares yesterday. Did you have your medications? Did the, the nurse teach you how to take your medicines? Did you have your outpatient appointments? Were all your questions answered? And if they came back, why were they sick enough to come back? Um, did they visit the doctor after hospitalization? Why or why not? How are they taking their medicines? Are they taking them according to plan? Maybe there's some um, illiteracy issues or language issues. What were their meals since discharge? Were they having those pork chops over there with all the salt? <laughs> I know you guys don't have heart failure, but your patients do, right? <laughs> so were they having uh, you know, the high salt, poor compliance? They were discharged from the hospital. They went straight to McDonald's. Um, so create an interview tool. Create an interview tool. How about forming a cross continuum? As I mentioned, creating partnerships with skilled nursing facilities and your rehabs. So we did this. We actually created a very, very strong, cohesive partnership where I made, when I was division chief, a site visit to four nursing homes in the area. I had a, a tool with me with all the questions that I wanted answered. And then I met with the medical directors there with the administration and to, to make them understand that we're looking for readmissions reduction and how are we going to do this because although right now Medicare is penalizing us, it's going to be the rehab facilities and the nursing homes that are going to be penalized by Medicare, right? So it's, it's, it's going both ways. So we would make site visits and basically watch them do an intake. You know, how did the nurse intake that patient? What were they doing? Were there any deficits with that? And we invited them to come visit us. We actually had meetings once a month to sit down and go over this and, and, and to see how things were going. And frequent meetings after that to make sure that we were all on the same page. Because readmissions are going to harm the, the acute care hospitals, but then of course Medicare was going to penalize the, the skilled nursing facilities. Patient education and teach back. Um, the patient's not always the, the right one to teach, right? They may be illiterate. They may have had a stroke and they have an, an aphasia. They might have dementia. So is it the spouse, the, the child, or the sibling, or the significant other, or a neighbor who's taking care of them? Um, Got to teach them multiple times during the admission. When people come at our facility, and I'm sure it's no different here, for a total hip arthroplasty, they actually go for a class before surgery, right? To teach them this is what to expect. And then when they're in the hospital, the nurse practitioner also goes through and says, okay, these are the things that we're expecting and this is what's next in your care plan. And then of course when they come back. So patient education is not a one-time deal because people forget, right? People forget. Um, and so for the doctors that are in the room, the strategy that they taught me at IHI was have the patient teach back to you. Teach them three things. What's their diagnosis? What are the red flags? And what to do about the red flags? And so as you're telling them this, more than once during the hospitalization, they say, okay, Mrs. Martinez, tell me back what I just told you. I, 
and I just want to make sure because sometimes I speak a little fast and I'm testing myself to make sure that I taught you correctly. That way the patient doesn't feel like, oh my God, if I miss this, you know, or there's something wrong with these. So you sort of put it on yourself as a practitioner to make sure that they understand that you're trying to make sure that you taught them correctly and not that they, you know, they may have a, a deficit. What about your materials? Use very, very basic language, not only when you're giving them learning materials, but when you're talking to them, right? It's not, you know, your, your, your hypertension pill, it's your blood pressure pill. It's not your diuretic, it's your water pill. And make sure that you're using large font because people have problems with vision. I'm just north of 50 and I started using these glasses in the last year, so I can imagine the 70 year olds, right? And all written materials, they've got to match the terminology that you're using when you're speaking to them. Because if not, then they're going to be a bit confused. So, very simple, simple phrases, short sentences, no medical jargon. How many doctors do you tell your patients your renal function was bad today? <laughs> Nurses, your docs say that, right? Your renal function was bad. And patients look at me like, what the heck are you talking about? You know, what's renal function? You know, your kidneys are, are not working. Your kidneys are, are weak today or they're failing. But what the heck is renal function? Mrs. Martinez, your creatinine went up. What the heck is a creatinine, right? So you've got to be very, very simple in terms of the terminology that you use with patients. Um, telemedicine, do you guys use that here? Does it work? Do you have data? So according to this study, this was a systematic review just published a few months ago, there were 12 studies using telemedicine to reduce heart failure. And the bottom line was it's not quite ready for prime time. According to all these studies, it was, it was conflicting data. So let's see. So we've come to the end. We've come to the end. Hopefully, I've reinforced some of the good things that you're doing, and maybe you've learned a few other things that you didn't know before and showed you some data as to why some of this stuff works and what are some of the deficits. So what did we cover? Well, we covered who's at risk. We covered who's at risk by medical diagnoses. We covered who's at risk by surgical diagnoses. And I gave you two very, very well thought of risk prediction rules, one of which we use at, at my facility. We talked about what interventions work to reduce readmissions, whether it was the whole enchilada with Project Red at Boston University, or these single interventions that were either designed based on one of those factors, one of those 11 factors on Project Red, whether it was based on the diagnosis or whether it was based on just things like patient education and med rec and pharmacist intervention. Um, and now at the very end, we've given you a bit of a framework. What is the Institute for Healthcare Improvement? What do they recommend in terms of how you could look at your data um, and, uh, and fix it for yourself? So heart failure, COPD, pneumonia, they're still the most common reasons. When we looked at our own data at our hospital, what we found was sepsis and renal failure were also in, in our top five. We didn't have the GI issues and we didn't have the psychiatric issues. Those two came up. So the intervention that we put in place was we made sure that anybody who came in with, with uh, sepsis and with kidney failure, they had a home health nurse to go home with them. Um, so we did that. Surgical cases of readmission, they're there, they're less than medical. But believe it or not, those patients that were surgical cases that were readmitted, they were admitted for things like heart failure. And they were admitted for things like pneumonia, not because of the wound infection. Um, I was expecting things like maybe a DVT in it, and it wasn't even the case either. Uh, the hospital and the LACE scores, those are two risk prediction tools that have been validated, multi-center. Uh, consider implementing that into your electronic medical record and then communicate that with your physicians so that they know that you're using this score and what it means so that they can identify those patients and again the red flag will bump up when they're getting ready to discharge that patient for maybe more intensive therapies. Multiple, multiple strategies either alone or in combination will reduce readmissions. Um, and Project Red has all the bells and whistles, 11 of them, but maybe your chief financial officer won't let you have Project Red. Maybe your chief financial officer says, look, I'll give you a clinical pharmacist in the ED, or I'll give you a nurse practitioner to make phone calls after discharge, or I'll give you a discharge clinic, particularly for those patients who are not funded. You guys don't have a non-funded problem here, right? Nah, 
You know, so how do you handle those? Because whether they're funded or not, they, they still get readmitted. And if they're non-funded, you're not going to get reimbursed for it. Um, what else? Discharge handoff, patient education, eliminating medication discrepancies, and gap clinics, they've been shown to reduce readmissions. When you do it right, they reduce readmissions. Telemedicine, not quite there yet. Maybe for other diagnoses, but I didn't see anything. Um, partner with your skilled nursing facility colleagues to make sure that you're all on the same page and be a team and work as a team and meet regularly as a team and track metrics as a team. Hospital pharmacists are great and they work and they're wonderful colleagues. And as I mentioned, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement has a structured approach to help you drill down. That's my time and I thank you for yours. Thank you for listening carefully. I'm happy to take your questions. Yes? Uh -huh. So here we have physicians and nurse practitioners that work, but we don't have discharge nurses, but I've seen other, you know, that are part of the hospice service, not, not hospital. Yeah. Do you guys do that? So the question was, um, d does our system use nurse practitioners or nurse coordinators? Yeah, like RNs. RNs. So um, in our facility, each floor has a nurse practitioner who's a discharge planner. And the story is, is that there are patients who are difficult to get out of the hospital. You know, we have a big non-funded population. As, as you can imagine, a city like Miami is a lot of, of people who are either um, illegal or they just don't have health care. And so those, those ladies, they're all women and they're super. They're the ones that we go to to help us navigate the discharge piece, getting services for them and so forth, getting medicines for them if, if, they, if they don't have money. Another question? Yes, sir. I noticed that on your the slide that you have from the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, it was discussing the intervals for readmission. Yes. Uh, is there a significant difference in the reasoning behind it or other than time? I mean, is there like so the question was, if I may uh, repeat the question. So in the IHI, uh, one of the slides that it looked at the intervals, it was at the very beginning of the talk, yes? Yes, so it was looking at day one through 30 and it was looking at the incidence of readmissions by hospital day. Um, I do not remember that they told us anything about illness severity or by diagnosis. They just gave us that as just a flat, all comers. Right. All comers and you know, a significant number are readmitted in the early part right after discharge right. as opposed to later. Yeah, 66%, yeah. No, they didn't tell us, a, so they didn't tell us if there was a specific reason. They, again, they just gave us the data and said, in your facility, we're gonna give you the tools like we just discussed here, use those tools to drill down to find your information. Um, just another word as, as we're talking about d diseases and diagnoses. As I looked at this, because I, I was really very into to this uh, more so than I am now about 10 years ago. And as I looked at the data, I'm like, God, the data hasn't changed. Like, we really haven't moved the needle all that much, right? So the one thing that I've seen recently was all these surgical papers that came up. Oh, uh, reducing readmissions for prostate cancer patients and reducing readmissions for urology patients and reducing readmissions for different particular disease states that really weren't the high impact uh, diseases. So, you know, if you, if you know something about the Pareto Principle, the top four reasons are responsible for 80% of your events. And they were sort of looking at like, you know, the, the, the lower impact stuff. But at any rate, they got published. And, and the point is, is that people are looking at individual diseases because that's probably what's hitting their facilities and so forth. Anybody else? Great, thank you so much for having me again.